how do you define your politics or ideology and where did it come from? Do you consider yourself a libertarian or a classical liberal? Are these terms that are meaningful to you? Well, you know, there, there's a whole field of political theory that I don't really subscribe to uh, in terms of classifying people on the basis of their beliefs, uh, because what it's trying to do is it's trying to establish tribes. It's trying to mm -hmm. establish common identities. And while I do think that is valuable uh, and important for the sense of collective action, uh, for me, it's not really the right fit. Uh, I do see sort of uh, a clear distinction between people who have a larger faith uh, in liberties and rights uh, than they do in, in, in states and, and institutions. Uh, and this would be sort of the authoritarian libertarian axis in the mm -hmm. traditional sense. Uh, and I do think it's clear that if you believe in the progressive liberal tradition, which is that uh, people should have uh, greater capability to act freely, to make their own choices, to enjoy a, a better and freer life, uh, over the progression of, of sort of human uh, evolution, you're going to be pushing away from that authoritarian axis at all times because authoritarianism is necessarily uh, about the ordering and control of society. Now, they can argue that that'll produce a better quality of life, but it cannot be argued that it will provide uh, a freer life. Uh, and for me, I'm on the side of freedom. You're an autodidact in many ways. Um, you, you, know, you don't have fancy degrees, and you know, I don't see diplomas on the wall behind you. Talk a little bit about the process. How did you educate yourself, and how does that play into larger roles of the types of education that, that governments or societies give people? Is it to liberate them? Is it to kind of subjugate them? Uh, and uh, talk about where you came from in terms of your ideas and your, your self-learning. I don't want to necessarily say that, that the modern education system is intended to, to subjugate people, but we do know uh, clearly that it's overlaying a certain set of values upon uh, everybody who's engaged in that system. Now, those values don't fit everyone. Uh, and one might say they're not even uh, appropriate values uh, for a broad and diverse sort of liberal body, particularly one which has to be able to cast votes uh, in a self-informed, critically thinking way, uh, rather than one where, you know, the majority of education is, this is the history of this party and that party. For me, yes, I did not graduate from high school. Instead, I got a GED. And I don't have the formal education. Now, that's held me back in a lot of ways. Um, in, in terms of just wanting to have some kind of formal education, it's difficult to go back and get later on, like chemistry, right? I'm, I'm really interested in chemistry, but lacking the formal education, uh, it's just kind of a pain to go back and read the textbooks later on. Um, at the same time, I have a very broad and diverse uh, education on a number of different topics. And this uh, has helped me in my professional career because I was uh, much more conversant and fluent on a number of topics that ended up being very highly valued in the national security space that really aren't taught in school, particularly when it comes to sort of system security and anonymity online, uh, in, in certain ways, how to combat that. This illustrates a key point, which has been reflected by other thinkers before. It's, it's not original to myself, which is there is a very strong difference, a bright line difference between your schooling and your education. Uh, and we should all be careful not to let the one influence the other. Talk about, I mean, because you, you were working with people, and you've talked about this, who had similar backgrounds and technical skills, but then you brought a moral dimension to what you were seeing when you were working for the government or as a subcontractor. Did your education, I mean, is it a moral education that was lacking in the people around you? Or was there something in the way that you learned that triggered that sense of saying, you know what, we all know this is unconstitutional or this is wrong, but it was you who decided to actually bring it to the public's attention. Well, I, I represented a different generation in many ways uh, than the majority of sort of the, the institutional structure at the NSA and, and CIA because, of, of course, I was, I was the new group in. Uh, but I was also sort of the first generation uh, of children of the Internet, right? When you think about where my, my biggest influence are in that uh, context, my reading, my writing, uh, while, of course, yeah, we, we read the history, of course, yeah, we read the books and the traditions and the classics as well. 
which classics do you get directed to? Which come to your attention? That becomes part of sort of a zeitgeist debate that occurs all around the world. Uh, you have a much larger mixing of perspectives. And because of that, nationalism is, uh, blind nationalism is less uh, effective in many ways. Because there's a very real difference between allegiance to country, allegiance to people, and allegiance to state, which is what nationalism today is really more about. The institution can come and go, but the people remain. And this, this kind of, of context is what differed. I brought a constitution in uh, and, and put it on my desk because I had a personal interest in it. And I thought it was relevant to the work. And there were a number of uh, people that I worked with, coworkers and colleagues, particularly when I started raising sort of the alarm internally about these programs and saying something doesn't smell right here, uh, who agreed with me, who were interested, uh, who had different interpretations, who challenged uh, back and forth, but who cared. And then there were others who didn't, uh, who said the Constitution doesn't really matter, and who would literally say, you know, who cares about the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, uh, and so on and so forth, the First Amendment. Uh, it doesn't really matter. This thing's from hundreds of years ago. It's no longer relevant. And look, we've got a job to do. There's bad guys out there, uh, and we're going to decide who they are and what we're going to do about them. The problem with that, that I would argue, uh, is how designations of national security are made in the first place. There's a real life case here that I think is relevant to a lot of people where the FBI had a lead on an individual. They were a religious leader, sort of a community leader that the government, the state believed was in contact with or uh, under the sway of sort of agents of foreign power. And this is common with all people who are involved in any kind of radical politics. If you challenge the prerogatives of state, they presume it's at the direction of another state because that's simply how the thinking works. Uh, the attorney general was briefed on the case. They said, yeah, let's wiretap this guy. Uh, even though he's a US citizen, uh, son of a popular cleric, fairly well known. Um, and they put him on a watch list, said uh, in the event of a national emergency, martial law, you know, FEMA and so on and so forth, we're going to detain this person because they're dangerous. They're a destabilizer. They are a radicalizer in the modern vernacular. Uh, and the FBI eventually made a determination that of all of the similar radicals in the United States, this individual was the most dangerous from the standpoint of national security. Does anybody in the room know this case? Do you recognize it? Mm. Yeah. And the determination was made two days after he gave the I have a dream speech. That is what a threat to national security looks like. There's a very real difference uh, between the public interest and the national interest. When you hear national interest, when you hear national security, think state interest, think state security, and you'll be on the right track.